Right, everyone, today we're going to be going through the remainder of the Pyramid of Success, how to ultimately find 100x to 1,000x cryptocurrency gems in the market. I have made this for you guys. If you do wish to access this, join that Discord server. It is in the resources section. Feel free to use this with your research, but apart from that, let's get straight into that video. My name is Zach. Just remember, nothing I say is financial advice. I hope you're doing well. If you want to join that Patreon, the link is in the description to cure this price for life. And apart from that, let's get straight into today's video. So the reason I crafted the Pyramid of Success is to ultimately give you guys the control over your research. No, I'm not going to charge you $9,800 for this course. And no, it's not 60% off. It is absolutely free. And I guarantee this is going to work because this is how I found gems like Tectum, like ZK Swap Finance, like Mintlayer, like AGI. Like, oh, we found so many gems using this process. And I guarantee if you follow it correctly, it is going to work a charm. No, you don't need every single one of these things uh, to be ticked off. If you have every single one of these things ticked off, you've got yourself onto a very, very rare and very, very big project in the making. But if you use this and say, for example, you know, you, you haven't got a team docs, but you've got a protocol docs, the tokenomics may not be the best, but everything else is good, you know, you've struck gold. So ultimately, this is going to be entirely free. You can access this in, the, uh, in that Discord server and you can use this for your research. I'm more than happy to use this for your research. Pass on to your friends. I do not care. But this is a really good process. But also, thinking in the mind of a retail investor like we did in the last video is ultimately going to allow you to achieve the most success possible. And it's not what a lot of YouTubers talk about. They just talk about the narratives that are going to pump, but they don't talk about the way that retail is going to think and where they're going to be putting their money because it's two completely different genres. Anyway, let's get straight into part two of this video. So what I'm going to go on to and have a look at next is the roadmap. There's a few reasons why I do this, but the main one is for me to get an understanding what the path going forward looks like for this project. I don't want a roadmap that's very, very bland and saying they're going to be doing the most basic upgrades known to mankind. No, I want some big upgrades with a combination of small upgrades. When you're looking at a roadmap, sometimes they're not up to date. Developers sometimes stab themselves in the back making a huge list of resources in their actual documents. So I'm looking for a roadmap that's at least getting updated once per month. Sometimes they say the last time I was updated and sometimes they don't. But if you just keep checking back, you'll get a, a rough under, uh, understanding of this. But essentially... When we're looking at a roadmap as well, we want to see what the big bullish upgrades that are coming for the project are going to be because these can be great ways for a price to increase in the future. And I'd much rather a big thing get completed in a bull run compared to a bear run because this is going to get the eyes and attention of a lot more people. So also obviously in the box. 2024 roadmap outlined. I don't want a project's roadmap that's done in the end of 2023. Like there's, they need to have the 2024 roadmap outlined. Ideally into 2025, but at least that 2024 roadmap, what they're going to be doing over the next four quarters um, is going to consist of, but also have they completed different tasks and uh, on time and also up to date. So when I'm saying completing previous tasks, obviously if the project launched a week ago, they're probably not going to have too many things completed. But if they started about a year ago or six months ago, and they've only done one thing on their roadmap, it's not looking too good. So you can really narrow down your projects and identify if this project is going to draw some nice attention in the future and get a rough idea on what that project or product is going to look like in the future as well. The next thing is the team known, or if the team isn't known, is the protocol docs. So you want to ensure that, you know, your project might not have the team known. It's very, very good if the team is known. And I always lean towards team known projects compared to projects that don't have the team known. But if their team is not known, is their protocol docs. So a lot of projects nowadays, such as decentralized finance projects, have their actual protocol and utility docs. So a lot of projects nowadays also have to go through a very strict process in order order to ensure that their protocol is not going to be malicious to the market. So all in all, if their team isn't known, is their protocol doxxed? So that's very important in my opinion, but it's not a make or break sort of thing. But I wouldn't have a project in my safe players if that team isn't known. Tokenomics. So is the token distribution and vesting schedule justified? So obviously a coin with 50 to 100% of the coins in circulation is more ideal. But if you're looking at a project and having a good old cry because the circulating supply is 10%, well, I'd recommend looking into the actual vesting schedule. So when we're looking into the vesting schedule, we want to see how many coins are going to be in circulation by the end of this year, end of 2024, halfway through 2025 and the end of 2025, because that's most likely when the bull run is going to be at its peak. 
and this is really going to be an important number to ensure that we know what those coins, oh sorry, essentially what the market cap we're playing with now is and how many coins are going to be in circulation after an X amount of time. Gaming projects are known to have some of the most horrendous tokenomics in the actual cryptocurrency space. So you want to ensure, you know, by the end of the period that you want to pull out cryptocurrency, how many coins are going to be in circulation. You'll use that as the market cap that you're playing with now and then come with that, uh, sorry, come to that decision on is this project likely to do X amount of gains, you know, with this circular, uh, with this uh, fully diluted market cap. So what we want to look at is the tokenomics, the vesting schedule. And if a project's utility outweighs the tokenomics, I always go off utility. I will never invest in a project just because they have bad tokenomics if that utility is revolutionary. I mean, when I first got into Tectum, it was about 10% of the, oh, I think it was under 10%. It was like 8% or something in circulation. And all of a sudden now, it's at 50% or something like that. And it's only going to go up in price and with popularity. So tokenomics is a big thing, but I wouldn't worry too much if that circulating supply is low. You just got to justify it to yourself. And if obviously, if you want to invest in coins that only have 50% circulating supply or greater, then stick to your plan. Technology development, are they updating and improving their technology? It kind of comes back to the roadmap, but we want to ensure that a project isn't just going to be stagnant in the position that they are now. We want to see new technology and new utility coming out for that project. And are they upgrading the current utility that they have? This will also bring bullish aspects down the line and make, you know, investors more prone to invest in this project compared to another project because these people are constantly updating that utility that their protocol or project is providing. So it's very, very good in my opinion. And I wouldn't invest in a project that doesn't have a thoroughly outlined roadmap or, you know, a rough idea on what they're going to be doing going forward. So not a rough idea, you know, an idea. And so retail and us investors know what is coming for the project. So we can ma uh, basically make a rough idea on what that project is going to look like in the future. So we come down to our last few aspects of the pyramid of success, and these are really refining our projects. That's what this last line is used for. But what I love to see is social media active. You know, it's not a very big part that people think, but if you have a project on Twitter, which is basically the cryptocurrency hub along with YouTube, is their team constantly updating their community? Is the development and updates and plans made public? Are people up to date with what is going on? Are they telling people essentially what they're doing, what they're planning, if they're attempting to break world records like Tectum, those sorts of things. So as social media active, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Telegram, whether it's Discord, whether it's YouTube, whatever it may be, is it up to date? It's very important because it also shows that the team is taking the time and setting a budget for uh, their social media side of things. Things. With the holders, I'm looking at two major things. One is there any large holders or whales that we call, uh, as we call them in the cryptocurrency space. Obviously, if someone is holding 20% of the supply, let alone something like 50%. It's probably not a coin I'm going to personally invest in because I know they're eventually going to want to get out. This can either cause the price to go sideways or plummet dramatically. And what is the team's allocation and what is the team's locking period? So there are a few projects out there where the team's allocation is around, you know, 20 to 30 percent. I would never invest in a project that has that allocation. But around that 10 percent mark seems to be the sweet spot and it's at least a 12 month locking period. This kind of builds uh, a little bit of trust in the community as well, but you definitely don't want any large well holders. I mean, if you have a few people with like one, two, five percent of the circulating supply, it's a different story. But if something holds, or sorry, if someone holds, you know, twenty percent of that supply, or the creator holds ninety nine percent, you obviously know something's a little bit fishy there. But just bear in mind. Sometimes you will look in, you know, these scanning uh, protocols online, such as Etherscan and Polyscan, and you'll see that there might be 60% of, uh, you know, the coins in one certain area. This could be the smart contract or it could be a co uh, token deployer. So just ensure that if you're looking at something that's holding 60% of the coins, is it actually a wallet or is it a smart contract? Usually it'll have a little contract symbol on the left-hand side, but it's always better to ensure uh, who is holding these tokens and how much they are holding. Twitter followers. I mean, this isn't really a big thing, but you know, if you have a project that's a $1 million market cap and they have 500,000 followers on Twitter, you know, something's a little bit fishy there. So, you know, sometimes they bought their followers. If it's up to like, say for example, the market cap is $10 million and they have 50,000 followers on Twitter. Well, that's not really a big red flag in my books. But like I said, if they're a one or $2 million market cap and they have half a million followers, I'm going to be asking a few questions there. So just making sure it is justified or the market cap to, uh, uh, market cap to Twitter followers ratio is justified as well as, you know, Instagram, Facebook. I don't even know if coins use Facebook nowadays, but Twitter is a very big thing. 
one thing I love to look for in a project, and this is a very, very big thing, is a black swan aspect. What does this mean? Well, basically it means what is their standout feature that makes them unique from other projects. So every project should have one of these aspects. If they do have one of these aspects, you know that they're bringing something new to the market. For example, Tectum, it's the fastest blockchain in the world. That's their black swan aspect. And you can kind of tell this from different projects and you can see what they're really pushing their project to be. And they should be pushing this with their marketing so that people know what their black swan aspect is. It comes back to revolutionary technology, but we want to see something that is different that no other project is using. So they're not just one of the sheep, they stand out from the herd. And lastly, this is also probably the most important thing you can have with research. And I've left it to the very end so that the people that have clicked off this video don't get this information because I don't share this around too much, but it's an ecosystem analysis. Are they in a growing ecosystem? Are they providing an ecosystem? So for example, let's say for example, a Solana gaming project, they're in a growing gaming ecosystem and they're in a growing ecosystem, which is Solana. Or for example, Shadow, Mint Layer, Injective, say those sorts of projects, are they providing an ecosystem that can grow? Alrighty guys, that is going to be the end of today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed the pyramid of success. Trust me, it does work and this will really help your research out. It's helped me out a lot and it has grown my investing skills with time. But basically, this is all the aspects I look into uh, when I'm looking into a project to ultimately determine if this project is going to achieve success or if it's going to fall a little bit behind. Apart from that, I hope the markets have been trading you as well and I'll see you in the next one.